Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. We are delighted to have one of our partners joining us, BARCOM. David Deerdorf will be presenting on optimizing warehouse operations with barcode and RFID technologies. And as a reminder, we are recording this webinar and it will be posted to our on-demand webinar library for you to review again or share with anyone. And you can find our library under our resources tab on our website and that's anovia.com. And we do encourage you to ask questions during our presentation. So please feel free to type them into the questions box and we will answer them at the end of our session. So now I'm gonna turn it over to David to kick off our presentation. Well, thank you, thank you Angie, and, and welcome everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, evening, uh, depending upon where you're located. My name is David Deerdorf. I'm a sales engineer here at Barcom. Uh, the, uh, I've been in the barcode business uh, with Barcom since 2020. Uh, 2010 and been in the barcode business since 1995. Um, I wanted to start the webinar here to talk a little bit about uh, Barcom background and get into uh, the various hardware pieces that we see uh, in the barcode uh, world. So with that said, uh, what we do here at Barcom is uh, we've been in business for 31 years. Uh, we're headquartered in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, I myself am based here in the Atlanta, Georgia area, a small town called Woodstock, just north of the city. Uh, but we we have a full staff of uh, engineers, uh, sales engineers, programmers, and administrative folks to serve our customers. Uh, we specialize in, again, barcode and RFID solutions mainly and basically to track things, whether it's a, uh, an object like an engine block or a box of candy bars uh, or tracking uh, a service order out in the field. Uh, we apply barcode and or RFID uh, technology to identify and to track that asset. And that's what we'll be talking here in the, in the forthcoming slides. Uh, consulting and specialization, pre and post sale support, we definitely like to be involved at the beginning of your projects to help design a, uh, a robust system in a lot of different aspects, which we'll chat about. And then the post sale support, uh, we're not just selling a piece of hardware, hardware and, and, and leaving the country. We, we want to support whoever we sell to, you know, for the life of the relationship. So. We're here to stay 31 years. Uh, we don't have too many customers that are angry with us. You see that we're uh, spread across the United States. Uh, we probably even have a few more dots to cover in uh, Canada and uh, in Mexico. Uh, and we, we like to be an extension of your team. So again, we're not just selling a piece of hardware or a box. We wanna be involved in the beginning stages of the projects to understand what you're what you're trying to do uh, uh, offer best practices and best solutions to make your processes 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 better and improved and that's what uh, everybody's going for uh, we do have uh, uh, different partnerships with major manufacturers of the hardware two are listed here zebra technologies and honeywell corporation they're the two big guns here in the united states I Kind of refer to refer to them as the uh, the Chevy and Ford of uh, our industry. There are certainly others that we support as well. Uh, Data Logic uh, to name one, but uh, with Zebra and Honeywell uh, priced performance, their collection of offerings pretty difficult to beat. And uh, we've been working with these folks for many many years, and we have the high level of partnership with them that affords us good pricing to pass along to uh, folks like yourself. So our, our solutions really uh, go into a lot of different spaces. Warehousing uh, and distribution centers is definitely probably number one, maybe accounts for 50% of everything that we do. Manufacturing, and it can be a lot of different manufacturing uh, from pharmaceuticals to food and beverage to uh, 
just about anything. Um, uh, retail and e-commerce and then healthcare applications. Anywhere where we're tracking patients, we're tracking product. Uh, that's where we uh, kind of fit into the picture. And it's not so much verticals that we cover, uh, you know, specific industries because we see in warehousing, manufacturing, distribution centers, it encompasses a, a, a many, many different types of industries. Um, and you'll see here just some, some slides of, you know, folks reading uh, down conveyor belts, reading in the warehouse or a service box uh, delivery. Uh, wherever we need to track a package, a product, a person, uh, that's that's kind of what we're talking about here. And and where those solutions fit, you know, where the barcode solutions fit, the RFID solutions fit, uh, picking and packing, shipping and receiving, asset tracking, uh, those are all main parts here, the nine food groups, as I call them. Um, and we were looking to improve accuracy, uh, improve uh, the speed uh, and the processes, uh, had doing more with uh, more with less, but more greater efficiencies, uh, and increasing at the end of the day uh, your customer satisfaction. If you know what you have and where it is, you're not going to be overbuying. You're not going to be underbuying, which uh, can translate to you know misshipments to your customer delays to your customer, et cetera. Uh, not to mention, of course, if you don't believe something's in your warehouse, but it actually is, uh, you can spend you know, more money to replace that when you really didn't have to, so overbuying. But there's long lasting benefits. Uh, I don't think there's one company that I've worked with who uh, started off in, on paper and pencil to track their, their goods uh to then getting automated with barcode uh i haven't had one customer say it was a bad decision on their part but 99 of the people say how did i live without that how did i live without uh knowing what i have where it's at uh the the procedures and the processes the streamlining of those uh and and how, how that helped in individual businesses uh, so really, we're here more, more or less to talk about hardware offerings in, in this light. And I, there's, there's a, many different, I call them food groups in the, uh, the product offerings, but we're kind of going in, uh, in chronological order here. So if you were to call, we were to chat, uh, you're looking for to automate your warehouse uh, with barcode uh, tracking. First thing I would ask you is about your wireless infrastructure. So whether you have a 5,000, 10,000 square foot warehouse, a 2 million square foot warehouse, you have indoor and outdoor areas to cover. Uh, this is a service and offering that we perform for you. Uh, it could be an on-site survey, it could be a wireless, or excuse me, a virtual survey uh, done uh, virtually. Uh, but wireless infrastructure is something that, if, if done correctly, you shouldn't have to worry about. Uh, and and if it's if it's not done correctly, it's going to cause a lot of issues, and it shouldn't be done incorrectly. So, uh, with today's technologies and flexibilities on uh, access points and the strength, uh, we want to make sure that the best practices are in instituted. And the first thing is, if you're walking around with mobile devices that rely on that wireless network, that wireless network goes down. That's that's not a good thing. So, the the proper type of access point, uh, the configuration of that access point, uh, and the location of that access point all plays a part. I've had a lot of customers in the past. Hey, I don't have coverage in this corner of my building. Let's throw more access points on it. Well, more times than not, that's not the answer because you can flood your warehouse with too much coverage. Uh, other instances might be, hey, I'm not getting the coverage, so let's turn up the uh, the volume or the gain, if you will, on the access point for better coverage. Well, that's not always a good thing either in that when those access points are talking to the devices, you can imagine if you're yelling at somebody, it's hard to understand them. And that's what the access points would be doing is yelling to the the devices down there and the devices don't know what's going on. So there's a basically a fine balance or mix between, you know, the access point where they're located and how those access points are configured 
uh, to have spread coverage where you need that coverage to happen. Uh, we run a very high success rate on doing wireless infrastructures, and we've done them coast to coast for folks in various building sizes. So very, very important, your wireless infrastructure. It's all, we're talking mobile. Now, with this said, uh, you know, 802.11, your Wi-Fi access points, et cetera, more, few more people are starting to get out now to, hey, I don't have a wireless infrastructure. Instead of doing that, I'm going to use a cell radio. Uh, instead of my 802.11. So we call a, a WAN or wireless wide area network versus a WLAN or a local area network. Uh, for those folks that uh, it's a lower cost of entry to get the mobility, uh, you'll have a data plan with a local a cell provider. Uh, so long as, of course, you've got cell coverage in the areas that you need, uh, that is an option. We can help you determine that too on a one on one consultation. Um, another big uh, piece of the puzzle here, kind of going in order, is bin location labeling. So when you receive your goods, you're going to put them away in the warehouse. You need a location to put them away. You need to scan your goods uh, and then scan the location. So we know that the blue box is in location 07010103. Bin location labels can come in all different sh shapes and sizes, uh, depend upon your specific needs. We have the overhead signs. We get typical rack labels where you can make them very small, make them very large. We want and would like to be a part of that design phase because reading that barcode at the distances and the angles and whatnot that you need to read them, we like to help engineer to make sure that we have the correct barcode size, symbology, symbology type and all that so that your operators are not frustrated and, and or taking shortcuts simply because they cannot read the bin location label. So it's a small part, but this is something that could be done at the early stages before any software or hardware in. Let's set our infrastructure internally. Let's get the Wi-Fi. Let's get the bin location label. Boom, we're done. Now we can start talking about, uh, you know, devices. And uh, one thing that we talk about with devices in the warehouses, how do I manage all these devices, the mobile computers? Uh, mobile device management, also known as MDM. It's a software that loads onto the device that uh, uh, then uh, can be looked upon from a dashboard in the IT department or wherever to push down updates, uh, um, look at battery uh, uh, life, uh, look at a host of things that uh, the user uh, is doing with the device, it's a good way to manage uh, whether it's a handheld or printers for that matter, uh, to make sure that they're deployed correctly, that they're configured correctly. I've got new installs and new updates coming in. Uh, it makes things uh, really simple. And basically the cost is per device per year, uh, it, it comes out to maybe six, seven dollars a month uh, per device per per year. So it's it's not a huge cost, but it's a huge benefit <clears throat> and something that those who are interested uh, contact me and, and that we can get a, a 30 minute webinar together, teams meeting together, we can do a demo for you and uh, let's see if it's something that's that's needed in your facilities. Barcode um, label printers um, are, are a big piece of the puzzle. They come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. Uh, there's a couple things that I'll ask when we look at printers where it's used. If it's a shipping printer, we'll use a direct thermal, uh, which does not use a ribbon, but direct thermal will fade over time in sunlight. So it's not a long term lasting print. Where thermal transfer uses a ribbon, it's uh, you know, scratch resistant uh, on a poly material, it won't fade on a, on a paper material and more of a long lasting. Your bin location labels would be thermal transfer. Uh, but we look at communications. Are we plugging in in USB? Are we going to uh, uh, Ethernet? Or are we going uh, wireless? Or perhaps Bluetooth to the local device? Uh, there's a printer in inline for everybody. And, and you'll see throughout these slides, I'm, I'm referencing some Zebra products, I'm referencing some Honeywell products. 
we're not tied to one or the other. These are what we recommend, just again, from a price performance. Uh, if there's a brand or a line that's more compatible with what you know, uh, we have access to virtually everything and we're sort of agnostic to all this. So I'm not trying to promote Zebra or Honeywell in these conversations, but just giving you examples. So here with the Zebra, you have the industrial printers. These are what we call tabletop. They're generally made in uh, metal housings, uh, or a higher industrial plastics uh, can uh, print thousands of labels per day uh, on a duty cycle. Uh, they come in a four inch wide or a six inch wide. This is for high volume, uh, you know, all day printing. Mobile printers uh, are those that uh, folks would walk around in the warehouse and, and, and mount these either onto their belt or mount onto a mobile cart that is pushed around the warehouse. And the point here is, rather than having that operator go back and forth to a fixed printer station uh, that takes time time is money average over a day there's a lot of moving back and forth he or she can print that label right from their hip or from their mobile cart or from their uh, forklift whatever they're on mobile printers would uh, run uh, traditionally over the wi-fi network your 802.11 and just be another printer or it can be bluetooth to the local device Desktop printers, uh, kind of in the same category a little bit as the industrial, other than desktops are just lighter duty. So, you know, anything that's say 2,000 labels or under per day, a desktop printer would do you. Uh, these are smaller, a little bit lightweight, quote unquote, but I've got customers using the desktop printers now for eight years and they're still rolling. Uh, you know, replace the, uh, the print head. Uh, you replace the, the platinum roller, that's that uh, rubbery roller that feeds the labels. Uh, those will uh, wear out over time along with the print heads. But uh, as far as you know, toughness and ruggedness, uh, they, these really can't be beat. Honeywell also has a full line of printers that are equal to these uh, Zebra printers. And we talk about a little bit about the in, individually industrial printers uh, where they're generally um, generally held. If you have a, a high shipping department, a lot of shipments, we see industrial direct thermal uh, printers out in the shipping. Uh, we have uh, high asset uh, labeling to do. Um, you know, again, over something over a thousand, say over two thousand labels a day, a thousand to two thousand a day. This would be uh, this would be your your choice, and then the mobile printers and the desktop printers uh, happens to be the ZQ five twenty is a very popular one along with the ZD six twenty one printers uh, rugged designs uh, very easy to operate, and I always like to say very simple uh, to change uh, your your labels and or ribbons. Now, one thing that we can talk about the be difference between an industrial printer, uh, one thing to consider is these guys will hold uh, a label roll of eight inches outside dimension, an eight inch OD, eight inch outside dimension label roll. So you get a whole lot more labels than you do per roll than you do on, for example, the ZD621 that has a five inch uh, maximum outside diameter. So your your what 40 percent uh capacity in the smaller desktops than you are the industrial so depending upon how many you're printing often you're changing the rolls things of that nature and then zq 520 the portable printers even go smaller uh, down the three inch od two and a half to three inch outside diameter so even less rolls and it's also noteworthy to, to point out that mobile printers uh only available with direct thermal print not thermal transfer so uh just an fyi there uh we talk about scanners these are just barcode scanners that you would use at your shipping station used to tie into uh, a vehicle mount terminal tie into a tablet uh, any any host system so these what i call dummy scanners or wedge scanners reading 1d or 2d codes uh, uh close distance far distance USB connection or a Bluetooth connection. Uh, in some cases uh, where it's really needed, there is an Ethernet connection uh, one with uh, the Allen Bradley uh, 
uh, PLCs. But things to consider with scanners, what's what's my environment? Am I in a steel mill and there's a lot of dust, dirt, dirt grime, a lot of heavy, you know, industrial users? We want an industrial scanner. Uh, the granite from Honeywell is an example of a, a, a very uh, industrial scanner. Uh, I can demo it by throwing it across the warehouse room, bang it across the, the uh, walls, and it'll still survive. Um, uh, everything's kind of protected around it, uh, rubber bumpers and moldings and such. And uh, in the ceilings, uh, IP65, that's dust and, and 30 pounds of direct water spray. So very, very rugged device versus the Xenon series as an example. Uh, still a very a pretty rugged device, but I wouldn't use it in a steel mill. Uh, regular warehouse operations, sure. A uh, little bit lighter weight plastics, but you know, again, I've got customers that have been using these for years and you know they may not look pretty, but they're still scanning. Um, and uh, both of these are again offered in different communications protocols as well as different uh, scan engines, which we're going to talk about scan engines a little bit later here. Um, the, the benefits of barcode and RFID handhelds, um, which we're going to get into here, we have uh, we eliminate the, the the big thing with, with scanning is you're eliminating human error. So basically, instead of the human being typing in the product number, or whatever we're scanning, product number or whatever asset label, and having an incorrect keystroke, barcode scanners just read it as is and a whole lot faster. So it's data wedge input rather than typing on your lap, on your keypad, we're scanning it right from the scanner back into the host. Uh, and chance for errors uh, on most common symbologies, your code 39s, uh, if you're using data matrix, wow, uh, or code 128. Chance for substitution or errors like one in 10 million. So it just, you know, it's not going to happen. A chance for a human to do an enter is probably one in, you know, 10,000. Um, the other thing with today's scanners, uh, with the uh, decoding algorithms in the scanners themselves, uh, we can read now read more poorly printed labels, fading labels. Uh, they might be damaged with uh, other uh, smudge marks. We may have overprinted, maybe underprinted. Uh, the scan engines of today versus 20 years ago are, in my opinion, night and day. Um, so that's good. The other thing is, if you are using a uh, a, a Bluetooth device. The batteries uh, longevity for those Bluetooth devices uh, it, over the last 20 years have probably doubled in, in, in length as well. So instead of getting a four hour operation out of a Bluetooth scanner, you should get a full shift out of it. Uh, and there's even battery free options now where uh, it uses a, a high capacity capacitor uh, charge, takes I think 45, 50 seconds for it to fully charge. And then you're off and going with a Bluetooth scanner with no battery uh, with up to 450 decodes in it. So that's a, a pretty neat endeavor that uh, some of the manufacturers have come out with. Um, but really, the crux of everything in, to, to me is the mobile computers. We call them mobile computers. Uh, um, you would think, oh, a mobile computer, that's just a laptop. Well, in our world, the mobile computers are the, the handhelds. Uh, devices that you'll see in the bottom right corner, the two gals holding a smaller, we got better pictures forthcoming, but the, a handheld device. So we're running nowadays, it's all Android OS. Uh, up to a couple of years ago, uh, Windows embedded, uh, Microsoft Windows uh, embedded was the operating system for everybody. Well, most of you know, Microsoft dropped all that line. And so now everything's Android. And they come with all the handhelds, uh, the wearables. You see the gal there in the red shirt. She's got a, a wearable computer, a vehicle mount on the forklift there, uh, and, and rugged tablets. We're going to talk about each one of these. But these are all Android-based OS now. Uh, we've run them through their course uh, since, since the Androids came out you know, a couple years ago. 
uh, we all we know the little tricks of the trade and uh, the best practices to get get those guys up and running. Uh, handhelds, uh, we're going to look at a Honeywell product uh, that's very common is the CT45 versus and the CK65. This is a good picture of on the right the 65 kind of a traditional handheld mobile computer, meaning uh, you have the external uh, keypad. You've got a nice four inch uh, high definition screen, touch screen. Uh, you got the pistol grip handle, uh, barcode uh, scanners embedded into it, of course, along with your uh, uh, cameras. Um, a lot more software nowadays are, are accepting devices without the keyboard. Uh, so it creates a little bit uh, lower uh, footprint like the CT45, it's more quote unquote cell phone like, I don't like to use the word cell phone because there's a lot of differences between, but from a physical standpoint, uh, it kind of looks like a cell phone. Uh, so mobile computers, again, we like to be a part of the, uh, the pre-planning process with you all, uh, pre-engineering to determine what's gonna work best or fit for your needs uh, and your processes. Uh, more times than not, uh, it will require me or Barcom sending you a demo gear or demo equipment uh, to test. Uh, make sure that you know the feel for you is what you expected before you buy a munch or buy whatever. Uh, so dem dem demonstration units available um, and uh, kind of recommended in a lot of cases. Um, we do have on our um, website we have case studies uh this is a uh, actually a video which i'm not going to play uh but in the comment section or in notes there's a link to this video that uh, uh shows a lot of what we've talked about thus far uh when we when we select a mobile computer all touch or keypad or, or full keyboard like on the left here, all touch CT45. On the right, CK65 with keyboard. We first have to look at the software. Okay, what are you what are you running on it? Does it does it uh, is it conducive? Does it work? Is it certified with these devices? That's number one. Number two is we look at you know the users. If you're in a deep freezer, guys have gloves on. You know, bigger fingers. You know, hitting a hitting a keyboard external makes it a lot more um, uh, conducive to those folks, uh, more feedback. Yep, that I did hit the, the number two and you can feel it and push it where a touch screen, you, although they're capacitive and resistance, uh, it's it, for most operators in the freezer, for example, with gloves, it's a little bit harder to use that smaller touch screen. So uh, that's, there's not one that's better for or the other, uh, they both have their pros and cons. And to this day, you know, we're still uh, selling both uh, equally. And it just depends upon what your uh, needs are. Of course, with today's generation of workers, uh, the cell phone size uh, without keypads are uh, more desirable, a little bit more desirable because that's what folks are used to. And uh, we're agnostic to that. It's our job to uh, train and educate you on what works, what's available with that, and if you want to test it to get you gear to test. And with the mobile computers, uh, the all touch, um, you know, there's some advantages there. Of course, it's smaller, can fit in your pocket. Um, they, they are uh, rugged. It has an eight foot drop spec to concrete, which is very good. Uh, the CK65, the one with the keyboard, on the other hand, is a 10-foot drop to concrete. So you lose some ruggedness, but it's still classified as rugged. It's not just ultra-rugged like the CK65 is. Um, the, all, the other thing with the all-touch uh, computers, when they first came out, you could only get them with one available scan engine that was a standard range or a near, near range. Uh, today, uh, both Honeywell and Zebra have near and far range uh, scan engines available for these devices, which in, in my opinion makes it more of a usable device for the warehouse. And uh, that's, uh, that only helps us you know, with flexibility. 
all touch and they can coexist. So we do have customers that uh, have a mix, use both. Some operations and, and or operators prefer the all touch. Some folks and other operators prefer uh, the external keyboard. So it's not a matter if I got to choose one or the other, which device is best for my certain process. And it might be, it might be, hey, I'm all all touch or hey, I want the, key, the, the keypad. Um, but again, it's our, to reiterate, it's our job to educate you on what's available and what works and let you test it out. Wearable computer. So everything we've talked about has been handhelds, and you can see the all touch with the with the scan handle on it to make it more of a you know pistol grip aim and, and shoot for your barcodes, especially if you're reading far away. That pistol grip handle is going to be your friend because it's it's easier to aim on that barcode at the distance. But now we're going to talk about wearables instead of a handheld. This is a wearable that. Uh, for an example, the Zebra WT 6300, it actually attaches to the operator's forearm and then has a scanner uh, mounted on your index finger, or it could be a two finger or one finger uh, ring scanner. Um, in my opinion, or what my experience, there's always interest in wearables, uh, people ask for them, but you definitely want to try this before you buy um, because in most most folks will receive it they'll get it say yeah it worked good great but my operators yeah they'd rather have a handheld for different reasons for example trying to pick up a box that's laying on the floor well your ring thing your ring scanner can get in the way uh some folks say hey i don't want this thing attached to me in my forearm all, all day long well that's not going to work you know any points where it is touching you uh there's there's pads uh, uh sweat pads that are uh, sold in boxes of 10 or 20 that you would buy. And if, certainly if you're changing operators, you would change those uh, pads uh, so you're not absorbing anybody else's sweat and things of like that nature. Where I've seen this device come into play and, and really show its value on a number of places, the small parts picking. So you've got a number of operators there and they were picking a lot of little small parts to fill in orders. This was a great tool for them. They didn't have to pick up a handheld and 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 hold it, and then only have one hand operation. They've got multiple two hand operation. Um, so intensive, intensive fast scanning, mainly maybe for smaller parts picking. Uh, that's where a wearable tends to play. Uh, of course, this uh, uh, this device here, you'll see the WT6300, you have the device then with a keyboard on the side. That keyboard is an attachment. So you can get it without the keyboard and just do all touch, or you can get it with the keyboard so you can do either or. Kind of like turns it into a CK65, if you will, from an all touch device. And what's shown here, of course, is with the external keyboard. Uh, industrial tablets, boy, oh boy, um, these can come in a lot of different shapes and sizes as well. Um, we're referencing Zebra here just, just because uh, Honeywell's got good rugged tablets and there's a number of others out there. Things to look at for uh, rugged tablets, of course, is your size, uh, you know, 10 inch, eight inch, eight to 10 inches, your, your normal size or standard size, if you will. Um, you want to make sure it's not too big or not too small. Who's using it? Uh, do you need a built-in barcode reader? More than likely you would. What's that barcode reader need to look like? Is it all close range? Do I need to uh, look at near far range scanning? Normally these are used by a supervisor or a manager or maybe a quality control person. Uh, so maybe they'll need the, the near far range for doing more up close uh, uh, inventory uh, cycle counting or what have you. Um, but again, these come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. Uh, I like to work one-on-one -on -one with the customer to determine, hey, A, what software we're using on it, what we're gonna run on it, who's what type of person's using it, line them up with the appropriate uh, accessory options that are available for it. Uh, the Zebra actually has a, a turret uh, on the back of theirs with a built-in scanner that's real nice, rather than the scanner, scanner on the tablet itself. And it's an external scanner that's actually attached to the tablet. So a high in, higher intensity scanning 
uh, makes it a little bit uh, easier for the operator. And we've been talking a lot about scanning barcodes and this, that, and the other. Um, to me, one of the most important things is picking the correct scan engine. So everything we've talked about up to now, the handhelds, the where the finger scanners, uh, the, the dummy scanners, the wedge scanners, those are available at different communication methods, but they're also available with different scan engine types. Uh, Honeywell has what's called flex range. Um, the Zebra is the SE4850, just nomenclature. But these are devices that can read as close as four inches away and, and, and as far out as 30 feet away, depending upon the bar size of the barcode. Um, and I have a, a, bar, a couple barcodes here. You'll see uh, code 128, 50 mil. That means that the, the width of the narrow bar is 50 thousandths of an inch. The wider those bars are, the further away that we can read. That's why I like to get involved with your bin location labeling, if you remember we chatted about, so that we have the correct symbology and the correct mill size to read at the distances you would need to read. If you're expecting your operators to walk down the, the aisle in the warehouse and read third level um, uh, bin location and it's third level is 24 feet up, we need to just need to make sure we do our due diligence and get the correct symbology and mill size of barcode on there so that the operators don't uh, have any troubles reading those. And here's just an example. Uh, you know, we have a standard range. This is this happens to be Honeywell, but Zebra and everybody else has their own, and it's fairly similar. But a standard range, I always say, you know, oh, oh, pretty close to contact out to arm's length away or three foot away. So that's your standard range. If you're doing everything within three foot, hey, save yourself a little bit of money and go with the standard range. The flex range, you can see it'll be as close as, well, two, three inches. I, I say four inches, but two inches for the spec sheet out to, out to nine feet. Um, again, depending upon the, the size of the barcode, it'll go out to 30 feet. But for general purposes, this is what I like. Uh, this guy here, the XLR, three to 19 feet, that'll actually go out to 80 feet, depending upon the size of your barcode and everything in between. And the thing is, is if some of you all on the call here have had experiences with near far range uh, barcode scanning, uh, but don't have current experience, the, the, the current generation of these near far range scan engines are very nice, meaning if I read a barcode that's 50 foot above me on overhead, boom, I read it right away. And then I try to read a barcode that's a foot and a half away from me, it'll be instantaneous. So boom, boom, back and forth. There should be no lag or hesitation. We had that in older generation uh, near far range scan engines, but not today. Um, but at the end of the day, again, as we talk, we look at your uh, individual needs. It's determined you need to read at these distances. Hey, I'm going to send you a unit. You go out there and start reading, see if it, you know, suits your needs and satisfies your requirements. Uh, but that's a big thing. We, we don't want to minimize that. And getting the right tool in the, in the, for the right job, obviously important. Um, we'll talk a little about accessories. Accessories, my goodness, there's, of course, thousands of them, but I would say that the majority of folks, you'll see up in the right-hand corner, this is a, a quad dock charger. So you take the device, you set it in a dock, it charges while the battery's in it. This is showing the all-touch. It would also be uh, for any other mobile uh, computer device, whether it has a keyboard or not. Um, the batteries, by the way, uh, to, in today's devices, these mobile computers, two shifts pretty, quote unquote, easily to get two shifts out of them, sometimes three shifts. So if you only have one shift, hey, you don't need battery chargers uh, necessarily. We got our dock chargers, sits on here after the shift, guys come back in next day, they're fully charged and they're good to go. So dock chargers versus battery chargers, uh pieces for your your uh uh either your forklift or your uh, vehicle 
uh, maybe a delivery truck, what have you, and for your uh, vehicle mounts, your, your uh, docks for your uh, forklifts. Holsters and handles are also very popular. Most all the devices, you can attach a handle to the device. Uh, of course, it makes it a little bit difficult to put it in your front pocket, but you know, if, if it's intensive scanning, medium to long range scanning makes the job a little bit easier. These are removable. So maybe the operator in the morning doesn't like the scan handle, but the operator in the afternoon does, well, you just slide the scan handle on and off. Uh, and most of the scan handles today are dockable. So we look at these charge docks, we wouldn't have to remove the handle. It'll accommodate it in the dock itself, which is a convenient thing. And most all manufacturers kind of follow the same suit. And of course, there's holsters that uh, you can wear as a belt and, and slide the devices in like a you know, gun holster and different carrying cases, things of that nature. This is just a, obviously a small example, but uh, something that you know you want to consider. The last thing you want to do, especially if you're in a freezer, a guy leaves it in the freezer. Oh no, where's my device? Well, if he had a holster and he carried it with him, maybe he wouldn't leave it behind. Um, by the way, in that event, if you lose a device, uh, there are uh, options to locate that device uh, by pinging it over the wireless infrastructure. And we can chat about that. Uh, that's a whole other topic, but some of you might be thinking, hey, what if suppose I lay a device down in aisle 22 and I forgot about it and I'm looking for it now? Well, there's some, some tricks of the trade to to uh, ping that guy and, and actually find it, or at least get close to its last known location. Um, the other thing with all the mobile devices, you know, we're in a, an enterprise um, environment, you know, corporations, uh, operators use and abuse these things uh, more so than your personal device, your personal phones. All manufacturers have uh, extended warranties. Most of the manufacturers cover one year parts and labor, workmanship and such. But if you drive it over with your forklift and it busts up into 12 pieces, well, that's not going to be warrantable unless you have uh, an extended warranty. And most warranties that I present and sell and people uh, grab a hold of, people want, is a three year uh, with device replacement. So that means in three years' time, my device is fully covered. Anything happens to it. If I drop it, it's my fault. I break it in five pieces, put it back in a baggie, ship it back, it's covered. Uh, and any other thing that uh, happens with it. The only thing at time it's not covered is if somebody steals it, so theft or a fire. You know, your place burns down and the device melts, you can't cover it. But everything else is covered. And it's, it's a, a fairly nominal cost. I think it comes out to about maybe 100 bucks a year for each device as an average. And uh, that's pretty pretty neat to know that for the next three years, I know what my fixed costs are for these devices. You know, it's zero. I've got the investment in the upfront. I've got uh, uh, service contracts. I don't care what happens to them, they're gonna be covered. Now, if uh, another thing you can do is, and then we have a chat about that just came to my mind is, we don't do a lot of them, but strategically it helps folks out and it can be done as lease options, set of buying customers lease uh at least our professional services on the lease and all the, all the hardware and it's generally a three-year term with a one dollar buyout so you really want to know your fixed costs for the next three months the next three years here's your price you know per month everything's covered anything happens to these guys we got it covered at the end of the three years you pay a dollar and you keep your uh keep your devices then you'd have the options of extending your service contract on those devices so We'll talk about that, you know, as you uh, as we need to, but uh, something that needs to be said. Other information and resources on our webpage, barcominc.com. We've got a lot of uh, good stuff in here that our marketing department has done. Under resources, there's blogs, uh, solution, data sheets, and uh, application info. There's case studies and there's videos. So if you want to learn either more about Barcom, uh, learn more about uh, different projects. You know, it's, a, it's a good resource page there for, for your reference. And with that, I've met uh, my time mark and here is my contact information, email, phone number. 
And uh, again, I, I just want to make myself available to any, any of you out there. Um, we can we can chat about your specific uh, situation and uh, how we can help you. And with that, I think uh, we'll probably look at some questions if there's any questions. Uh, since I've been doing all the talking, let somebody else do the talking and try to answer some questions for you. So let's just see here. All right, thank you, David. Uh, we do have a couple that have come through. If anybody has any additional questions, now's the time to get those in. Or if you'd like to raise your hand, um, I can turn you off mute and you can ask away. But the first one is, what are current lead times for printers? That's a good, somebody must know about the printer issues out there. Uh, printers are, right now with the supply chain, it's probably one of the biggest thorns in our side. Uh, we're not immune to the disruptions in the, in the supply chain. All it takes is one component to delay everything. Uh, we, we do a lot of fixed mount scanning and there's one little connector that's holding up, you know, 40 fixed mount scanners that Coca-Cola needs. Uh, with printers, the, the, the challenge with printers is the print heads. Uh, they come from two locations, China and Japan. Uh, number one, print, print heads have almost doubled in cost, but they're hard to get, which is delaying the printers. I would not assume that the printer that you need is in stock. Um, a lot of times today, what we have to do instead of, hey, we normally sell the blue colored printer. Well, here's a red colored printer. It's going to do the same job for you, uh, and it's in stock. And the difference might be is one's uh, what they call non-healthcare. One is healthcare, as an example. In the healthcare industry, they use different plastics uh, for uh, disinfectant solutions and, and withstanding those solutions. We might be able to get you in that one that's you know $100 more, but you'll get it today and not in eight to 10 weeks. A printer today, yeah, we need, we need to count on eight to 10 weeks is kind of the standard lead time today. That's a, a general number. It could be worse. It could be better. But uh, uh, just a, a buyer beware. Somebody knew out there that printers are an issue. So, yeah. All right. Thank you. Next question is, how long does a battery last in the handhelds? Yeah. So the batteries themselves and all the devices, um, they haven't necessarily gotten bigger. Uh, over time. Capacity, yes, but physical size, they haven't gotten bigger. But more importantly is how that power is managed inside the device. And it's just uh, uh, being yet better utilized internally. So a fully charged battery in, in one of the uh, handheld devices, you'll see in the bottom left corner, that happens to be a Zebra device, the MC93, fully charged two, two to three shifts out of it. So um, Better batteries today, smarter batteries today. Uh, a lot of the batteries have chips in them now. They're smart batteries. So we talked about MDM and looking at devices. That's one piece to say, wow, that battery is not getting fully charged or that battery is low or that battery has been charged, you know, 100 times. And we know that after 150 times, you know, those are all just guess numbers, just throwing out numbers, but X amount of time we need to act. So instead of waiting for that battery to go bad, we can be proactive, get it changed out before it uh, fails. So yeah, uh, two to three shifts in a lot of these batteries today, for sure. Okay, thank you. And the next question is, how far away can I read my barcode? Yeah, so we looked at that earlier slide here. Let's see if I can go back to it. You know, the minimum and maximum distance that you can read a barcode with a, an individual device is dependent upon which scan engine type that you have in that device and the size of your barcode. So if this is a 50 mil narrow bar width, it's a bigger, fatter barcode, wider print. Uh, that's, that's definitely readable. It, say 25 foot, but a 10 mil, these little cells in here are 10 thousandths of an inch. It's a PDF 417. That might only read out to, to four or five foot away, probably four foot away. So the distance to read is the base upon what 
scan engine type I have and what barcode size that I'm reading. And when we talk about these dimensions here, two to nine, two to three, you know, those are based upon, uh, what's that, a 20 mil code 39. So as an example, but I will help you with that. And, and even with that, I often ask the customer, hey, if you don't know the size of your barcode, take me a picture of it with a, a rule or a scale in front of it. And I'll, I'll be able to tell you what it is and tell you what type of read distances that you can achieve, probably plus or minus you know, a foot, give me a break, but I'll be able to tell you what that type of distance based upon the scan engine that you have uh, and the barcode that you're trying to read, what that min max distance should be expected to be. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, thank you. And it looks like we have one last question. What is a standard warranty on the mobile computers? Is there one? Yeah, so manufacturer's warranties are uh, one year parts and labor, and that covers any defects that happen to it, um, maybe some, some minor uh, issues. If you drop it uh, in a, in a pail of acid or a pail of water, it's not supposed to go in water, uh, or you run it over the forklift, the standard warranty is not going to cover that because um, that's quote unquote accidental damage. Uh, you, you would need the add-on supplemental device replacement, which really it doesn't cost a whole lot, but that'll get you, that'll get you the full coverage for anything that happens to that device. So manufacturers out of the gates one year, um, all these manufacturers do offer a three-year or a five-year extended warranty. And I would say, to be honest with you, probably eight out of 10, 80% of the customers uh, take advantage or, or opt into that extended warranty. If you could think about a year and a half from now, you're working, everything's going, you're relying on these things, all of a sudden, Jimmy drops it from 50 feet down into just landed correctly on a bed of nails and the screen broke. Well. Now instead of having to spend out, you know, seven eight hundred dollar repair bill, I'm guessing, but I haven't seen anything under five hundred. Um, instead of repair bill, you know, you call us, uh, our customer service gal. Her name's Lori. You call Barcom and say, "Hey, I've got serial number X Y Z. This is what happened to it." We say, "Yep, that's covered under warranty." Here's the RMA with return instructions. You ship it back to the factory. And then uh, three to five days later, they ship it back to you, uh, either repaired or a, a refurb or a new one, depending upon the extent of the damages, if it's under the contract. So, you know, for me personally, uh, extended warranties, if I buy for my TV or my household appliances, and eh, I don't, I don't really buy into that. I'm not, but I'm, I'm here at home. I'm, I'm the one that's using it uh, in the, in your company. You know, you got to mix mixed number of people using it you know know how people are taking care of it or not taking care of it abusing it etc you know, it's protecting your investment so but it's the customer's decision you know some some companies are yep I, I need extended warranties on we believe in that other companies absolutely no we don't believe in extended warranties so we like folks to have them, you know, a year and a half later, something happens, you know, we can respond real quick. We don't have to tell the customer, hey, it's going to be a $500. Sorry about that. So, yep, that's that. So, hopefully that answers it. All right. Well, I believe those are all the questions that we have for you today. If anybody has any additional questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to your account manager here at Anovia Consulting, and we will get them addressed for you. So I just want to thank David for the presentation today. You're welcome. Thanks for having me, and, and thanks for everybody uh, participating and attending. Hopefully I wasn't putting too many people to sleep, but uh, those that have interest or need some help in this field, you know, we're pretty niche-oriented, pretty unique. Uh, my phone number, my email, I'm always available. So use us as you need us. And we appreciate it. All right. If you could put your info up, David. Yeah, the Barcom Inc. Uh, for more reference information as well as uh, there's a contact us page there. If, you, if you'd like to do that, just reference my name and it'll get to me. 
And again, thank you so much. All right, thank you, David. And thank you everyone who's watching today or if you're uh, watching on demand, thank you for taking the time out to join us. We do have a few more of our upcoming events uh, for me to let you know about. We have uh, more webinars that are being added on our events page, and that's anovia.com. And you can also check out our training workshop page at anovia.com slash workshops. We have a variety of workshops to fit your role. So check out the ones that are right for you and your team. And if you haven't heard the latest, latest Anovia Conversation podcast, we do have a library of podcast episodes for you to listen to. And you can learn more about our podcasts on our podcast page at anovia.com slash podcast. Browse our selection and subscribe so you'll get notified when those new episodes air. And don't forget to check out our conference page. Innovia will be attending Dynamics Con Live in San Antonio, Texas in September. That's innovia.com slash conferences. So make sure you read up on the details and register. There is a discount uh, for registering for Dynamics Con Live. All right, well, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you soon on another Innovia webinar. Take care, everyone. Thank you, David. Thank you guys. Have a good afternoon.